Good evening. This is finally the last speaker, actually. I, I am so happy to announce that this is the last speaker. And while we have been treated to stories all afternoon, I think I'll treat you to a little bit of a fairy tale. It's usually what they give people before they go off to sleep. No? <laughs> so a little fairy tale. I don't have any gadgets, although in tribute to the late Steve Jobs, I would like you to use one gadget. It's called the eye imagination. <laughs> okay. Also, I'll do a little trick that he used to do. You know what this pocket is for? Huh? You know what that pocket is for? That's where my paper is. <laughs> yeah, see? No batteries, no recharging. I can leave it with uh, so no. Alrighty. So I'm going to talk about two things in a kind of looping way which I normally talk about. Maybe that's why they find me entertaining, you know? It's called accountability and the other word that I invented to go with it, countability. Okay. <laughs> accountability. Uh, about 22 years ago, uh, I was in my mid-30s. And I got really bewildered. Na nawindang ako, no? na natuliro ako, as Filipinos would say. Why? Because I had managed to take the time to read that book by Stephen Hawking, uh, From the Big Bang to Black Holes, A Brief History of Time. No? And before that, I had been involved, as some of you know, I'd been involved in SR, in Things of the World. And after reading St Stephen Hawking, I said, what the? Nothing matters. <laughs> Nothing matters. You know, if you tried to follow the way, and remember Stephen Hawking wrote this for simple minds like mine. It was like simplified. He was an astrophysicist. And he tried to explain where our universe came from, where it might be going, where it might be expanding into. And I ko, oh my God, nothing matters. Everything is insignificant. All our wars. You know, all our tribulations. I mean, when you consider how less of a speck of a speck of a speck of a speck of an atom of a speck we are in the imagination of Hawking, and if you assume that, ano, sabi ko, oh man, what's left? And so what was left for me was just to continue working and to go back into a mode of what I call like really internal accountability. What do we finally control? No, it, uh, I'm, prone to, I'm, I'm prone to bouts of depression. Our constituency, the people that we like to spend our lives with. No? So that's where our accountability is. Uh, one of the things that complicated this problem is that at about this time also, in like 1989, was the beginning of the computer world, where our notions of reality as we measure them were being substituted by Photoshop, virtual reality, hyper-reality, in fact, hype. So much so that one of the most common things that we normally come up with is that I've told you a million times. I've told you a million times. So we call, you know how, how much telling that takes? I actually tried to put it into an equation that if I told you 3.26 times every hour, for 24 hours, I would have to take 12,775 days or 35 years to actually have told you a million times. <laughs> so sabi ko, parang, you know, that's why I, I always tell my daughter, I've told you twice, and that suffices, no? <laughs> and that suffices. So even just the accountability to our own thought, the fact that we sometimes say that we are doing it, we are doing this much, but have we actually measured with, like, painful precision, what we have actually done. Okay. Uh, so what happened was that I reverted to what I call an elemental, almost anal sense of control about what I could control. Uh, it didn't hurt that I was working in Singapore because anal control was something I knew very well there. You know? <laughs> not, not the anal that many of you like to go into the other sources of the internet for. No, no. The, the anal in the metaphorical sense. Okay? The, the anal in the metaphorical sense. And I sought refuge in the stabilizing effect of 10 hours of work 
five to six days a week. And then on my day off, I try to do art that I initiated on my own. Okay. And what happened was I tried to break down my resistance to this lack of, of control by breaking down into as much reliability and accountability as I could manage. So it's like a, it's, remember this is in the, this is in the light of hawking, you know? <laughs> this is in the light of that kind of disintegration of self that contemplating hawking does, no? And one thing, that, one thing that I did learn from this though is that creativity would not thrive in a disorganized matrix. Sorry, I will have to bother Rafa. Uh, one thing that, that eventually, while there is so much talk about creativity working within like the chaos and the freedom, I think what many of us sometimes strongly long for is the fact that there should be some kind of organization, there should be some kind of accountability that people should come to work on time, that people should actually do their projects as they say they would do and that they will not shrink after they become real things and that they could actually account for the provocations they make when they want to get a bigger name for themselves rather just, than just shrug their shoulders and leave it all behind, no? Uh, funny thing is that this lack of accountability, and I will tell you a little anecdote. Uh, some, some of you have heard this anecdote. This, uh, this, this does not spare people in the field, and I have, account, I have encountered this with both PhDs and uh, curatorial assistants. There was once when in the middle of a storm, I was in a national congress of the NCCA, and I was supposed to be a resource person. And because it was a storm, there was no electricity. So I spent the night with this particular PhD who is a rather high ranking person in a local university. And of course, because we were spending the night with no electricity, we were in the middle of vegan. It was a uh, intensity, uh, what, uh, what do you call that? Uh, signal number four. No, it was signal number four. And that, uh, we were eating, we were drinking tandwai and having some cornics. And then the next morning, he's supposed to introduce me. So remember, nagiinoma kami magdamaga, no? With people who are like in their 40s and 50s. Nagiinoma kayo. And he was supposed to introduce me. And he introduced me as somebody who, daw, who had won a coveted one Luna like award to go to Singapore. <laughs> so I think, where did this guy get this fiction? <laughs> the thing is, I applied for a job as an OFW. No? But it is funny because I thought, is it because he's a PhD that he can like, come up in front of the audience and like, just suddenly from the top of his head invent my own? Oh, no, no. So I was more embarrassed than he was. No? And then, of course, uh, there were some. There would be some. Inci inci uh, there would be some instances. For example, that I had a very intelligent uh, curatorial assistant, who I sent up to Baguio to the University of Baguio to scout for an exhibit that we were going to mount for the NCCA. And uh, the guy said, "Yes, yes, I've been talking to all the relevant officials." I said, "Can we nail things on their walls?" Said, so, yeah, "Of course, of course, I've talked to all of them." And when I arrive in Baguio, the first thing that the official says is, may we remind you not to nail anything on the wooden walls. So parang I mean, it, it happens. These are all just minor, no, but um, we do like to flaunt our sense of being uh, freer than most. But sometimes we must also be held accountable. We must also keep saying, oh, oh sablay ako eh, you know? Medyo sumablay naman ng konti, uh, so ano. All right, ah, this is, this, is an even, this is an even nicer thing. A rather more famous PhD that we worked with was curating a show we were doing f about the Pasig Museum, you know, was talking to myself and a couple of very important architects and a couple of very important visual artists. And the one thing that that PhD forgot to tell us that he was kicked out of the project. So we all came to the opening expecting our works to be there and they were all shunted to one side because he had conveniently forgotten to tell us that he had a disagreement with the project director and that he was kicked out of the project. So, but, well, I think some of you know who this is, no? <laughs> so then little instances you know, that we, we do sometimes accumulate all of our paperwork, all our gadgetry or our titles. But this, this tendency for just like bare bones honesty, a little straightforwardness, as they would say in British-oriented, no, no? 
uh, worry. So yeah, being on time. As in fact, one of my favorite quotations comes from the pop culture, Clint Eastwood, Magnum Force. Anybody remember 1975? A man's got to know his limitations. Because only when you know your limitations do you know where you push from, and then when you push forward further from, okay? Uh, but, yeah. And you do this all in real time, no? Okay. Ah, well, one thing I did, one thing I think I, I might say I was lucky for is because I could not sell any artworks, I had to work in newspapers. And the discipline, and I think those of us who work in daily media realize that this is a fantastic discipline, especially since some of us who have segued from the 70s, who came from the bohemian privileged culture of art for art's sake and unaccountability, find that actually, in fact, well, maybe it's a non-issue because I think that many of the new generation have already m melded this kind of institutionalized accountability and that they've been able to actually function within structures without limiting their, without limiting their freedom because they have just actually had that freedom there and what they need is actually the energy, the initiative, the industry to get it out there, no? So therefore, as I end this part of the, uh, no, I said that in Hawking's universe, I had to invent an inner planet because I could not cope with the universe. Now, next topic. Countability. So I invented this. I invented this word, countability, and it came to me recently. I had a project which is somewhere in Makati, and I live somewhere in Quezon City. So I had this basic problem of commuting, and we know what commuting means for those of us who are in Manila. I didn't like the institutionalized torture that they call the MRT, especially if, if any of you ever rode the MRT on rush hour. Yes. All right, and. For those of you who drive, maybe you'd also give a drive along EDSA a little bit of a miss if you wanted to keep your uh, serenity intact, no? So what I found was I took the buses. I took the buses. Uh, it's still a long trip, but I ironically, buses are almost empty because everybody's institutionally torturing themselves in the MRT, you know? And one thing that is always on the bus, aside from the video, is a noontime show that gives away a lot of money. It gives away a lot of money every noon time. In fact, you don't even have to go to the studio. They go in full entourage to your house. I, I once watched this episode where there was a guy who was on the verge of despair. He was about to bring his uh, wife and daughter back to the province because there was nothing there. They descended on his house. They, you know, they made fun of his roof. They made fun of his small space. But then they started to count out 1,000. 2,000, 3,000. And then they started to bring him a lot of food, you know, with sponsor stickers. And then they decided to say another 10,000 from another sponsor. And by the end of the day, the desperate guy, for everybody to see, had become at least 40,000 pesos richer. Now, I didn't know how long his life would last after that, being in the very abject condition that he was. But that, that was what was happening, no? And I said, wow. Uh, I think, in fact, if you actually survey broadcast television every afternoon, that's the main agenda. Giving away money in the name of a bigger corporate power. Okay, and we say, oh, yeah, well, artists were above that. Uh, yeah, until you're in an auction. Okay, until your work is in an auction or until you're working towards being included in an auction. And that it's the same kind of arbitrariness because there's a, there's a hidden talker behind that pushing up some kind of fantastic price on a work that is undervalued but overpriced and it happens to fall onto your lap. And as, as, as we know, it's only like, it happens only to 15%. But this has now driven, and this has now become a silent cultural motor of how we value things so much so that many people who are in the fields of curating research history say, well, I just, buy, I just might as well be a PR writer. Because it's like useless to research, useless to critique, it's important to be in the auction house. So, I mean, this 
from accountability to accountability, I think sometimes we must uh, render ourselves a little bit judicious about these temptations. Uh, it doesn't hurt every once in a while, but I think sometimes that we do tend towards it. Uh, like I say, we do want and we do want to always be seen with the latest gadget. You know, mine is called the iPit. No, naka iPit dito sa akong mano, you know. And it all costs money. And maybe this is also a hindrance to our actually being able to function with autonomy, with actual creativity, with actual freedom. What's my last sentence? <laughs> okay. Well, going back to Stephen Hawking. Towards those things, those centers of power that control all of this, what he, I always keep in mind that he also described that the black hole was a planet that had assumed so much gravity that it began to collapse on its own weight. And collapsing upon its own weight, it would drag everything else into its own density. And so I find that a nice metaphor to consider when we have such ambitions which might not actually make us able to orbit a bigger universe. Thank you.